Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Inform at the Commonwealth Club and KQED's series, special series called Walls and Bridges, Understanding 2018. And tonight's program, as Marissa said, will focus on the intersection of policy and racism. The Bay Area tends to think of itself as a unique haven of progressive policy that champions racial equality, but that's not necessarily the reality experienced by a lot of communities here in San Francisco and the broader Bay Area. Right now, from a severe lack of affordable housing to racial disparities in the criminal justice system, some argue that the Bay is anything but exceptional when it comes to addressing racial equity. And so we're gonna hear from our panelists about some of the policies and practices that really jump out at them when they think about what reinforces racism here. We'll look at things like gang injunctions, our bail system, the region's lack of affordable housing, and the dramatic demographic shifts that we have seen in recent years. And we'll also explore what steps can be taken to help make the region more equitable as well. One of the unique features of the event, as Marissa said, is that after our panel discussion, you, the audience, will have the opportunity to take part in a facilitated post-conversation reception. And so you can go ahead and tackle some of these issues yourselves, inspired by some of the comments of our panelists today. And let me introduce them to you. Alicia Garza is an Oakland-based organizer, activist, and writer. She's the Special Projects Director for the National Domestic Workers Alliance, an advocacy organization promoting the rights of domestic workers in the United States. Alicia co-founded the Black Lives Matter movement and organizing project that focuses on combating violence against black people. Since the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, she has become a well-known voice in the media with articles and interviews featured in Time, Mike, The Guardian, Essence, Democracy Now!, and The New York Times. She's also been on KQED a fair amount. <laughs> Alicia's work has been recognized by many, including The Roots 2016 list of 100 African-American achievers and influencers, the 2016 Glamour Woman of the Year Award, and the 2016 Marie Claire New Guard Award. So please welcome Alicia Garza. <laughs> Next to Alicia is Jeff Adachi, the public defender of the city and county of San Francisco. Before being elected as public defender in 2002, Jeff worked as a deputy public defender in San Francisco for 15 years and in private practice for two years. He's tried over 150 jury trials, including numerous serious felony and homicide cases, and some of the Bay Area's highest profile cases. As the only elected public defender in the state of California and one of few elected public defenders in the U.S., Jeff oversees an office of 93 lawyers and 60 support staff. The office represents more than 23,000 people each year who are charged with misdemeanor and felony offenses. Jeff Adachi, welcome to you. And to Jeff's right is Nikki Jones. She is a professor of African American Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Her areas of expertise include urban ethnography, race and ethnic relations, and criminology and criminal justice, with a special emphasis on the intersection of race, gender, and justice. Nikki has published several books, uh, one that was just recently mentioned that was released on Friday. She's also they also include Between Good and Ghetto, African American Girls and Inner City Violence. The one that uh, was released on Friday was is called The Chosen Ones, Black Men and the Politics of Redemption, which is based on years of field research in San Francisco's Fillmore neighborhood. Nikki's current research draws on the systematic analysis of video records that document routine encounters between police and civilians, including young black men's frequent encounters with the police. So welcome Nikki Jones. And Nikki Jones, I'll start with you. You have said something that I found very interesting, which is that you're struck by how well-educated San Francisco mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. the Bay Area region for that matter, and yet mm -hmm. confused, it seems, mm -hmm. by why black people find themselves where they are in this city. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what you meant by that and whether or not you feel like San Francisco's sense of itself may contribute to, at times, an inability to really understand what's happening in different communities of color here. <clears throat> yeah, first let me say I'm so honored to be on the panel with the <laughs> two of you, these folks who are, fi are on the front lines of fighting for, for racial justice and social justice, so it's a real uh, honor to be here. 
Uh, and you know, one of the things that I've learned over the course of my time researching and writing about San Francisco is that San Francisco thinks of itself as a special place, as a particular kind of place. Yet when you look at the experience of black people in San Francisco, and you look at the experience of black people in Chicago, and you look at the experience of black people in Philadelphia, San Francisco doesn't do too well, right? In, in large part because it doesn't have a black middle class, right? In those other cities, uh, even though they have some of the same challenges, have a black middle class. And so it strikes me, uh, and sometimes, and I, I did this on a recent uh, show me, I used, I, I, you know, I, I say that there's an ignorance. Right, and I, we got this one caller who was like mad at me. Was that our show? Our yeah, show. yeah, right. <laughs> you know, you're ignorant. If you want to change people's minds, you shouldn't call them ignorant. Um, but I say that I don't, I don't mean it in a pejorative sense. And in fact, there are things that I don't know. Like one of the things that you learn getting a PhD, right, is that you don't know a lot. Right, <laughs> you know a lot about something, like one small thing, but you don't know a lot about everything else. And that should be a, a starting point. That should be the beginning of, of curiosity, of, a beginning of seeking. But if you're not even in touch with that sense of ignorance, then you can't make that step. And you know, the, it, if you're powerful, it doesn't matter, because you can be ignorant and powerful, no one's going to call you on it. Right? If you're poor and ignorant, right, you can't afford, you, you, if you're poor, you can't afford to be ignorant. You have to know how the world works in order to survive. Right? Uh, and so I think that in, in that comment, the idea that it's not just about education, Right? It's also about a sense of knowing about the world right? and appreciating what others are telling you about how the world is for them. Mm -hmm. Alicia, I saw you nodding. I wasn't sure if there's was anything you wanted to add to what Nikki was saying. I mean, there's so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure where to begin except to just say yes. <laughs> and um, we are talking about this in the context of a rapidly dwindling black population mm -hmm. in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So I had the pleasure of organizing here in the city for over 10 years, um, mostly in Bayview Hunters Point. And when I started organizing there, uh, the black population was hovering somewhere around like 8%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, when I left in 2013, we were uh, hovering around 4%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's even less now. And what I learned um, through you know, working here was that the black population here is dwindling faster than any other major US city mm -hmm. besides post-Katrina mm -hmm. New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, and so what does that say about a city um, that does pride itself on its progressive values and should? We are a bastion um, and a beacon mm -hmm. for many who are seeking um, refuge um, in a number of different ways. And what I've learned working here is that um, black people have a hard time finding refuge mm -hmm. in San Francisco, even when we are generations and generations mm -hmm. deep in this city. Mm -hmm. That's right. Jeff Adachi, Nikki Jones said, when you compare San Francisco to some other cities, we don't do too well. And you know what she's talking about in a lot of ways, because the Public Defender's Office has done study after study about the issues surrounding housing, homelessness, and the criminal justice system, and how race basically touches all of that. Can you talk a little bit about what are some of the issues that you've identified as the public defender in San Francisco in terms of how race intersects with the criminal justice system? Well, sure. I think that when the Ferguson report came out, Department of Justice, right, everybody sort of raced for that and the numbers that were announced were astonishing mm -hmm. and established structural racism mm -hmm. you know, within that police department. And here in San Francisco, we're like, wait a minute, our numbers are much worse, mm -hmm. right? If you look at the police department numbers, they admit that they stop black motorists at five times the rate of mm -hmm. white motorists. Mm -hmm. And if you look at drug offenses, it's actually eight times as likely, even though per capita, African-Americans use, abuse, and sell drugs less than their white right. counterparts. Mm -hmm. And as we began asking the questions, right, because the first thing you look at is the disparity. And you have arguments and discussions about why there's a disparity. Some people say, well, it's because black people commit more crime. And you start looking at categories mm -hmm. of crimes, <laughs> and you say in the largest category, which, which are drug offenses, <coughs> as I said, Mm -hmm. the, the numbers just don't bear that out. So why would you have that great of a disparity? And if it, if it comes to, you wrote a book thinking mm -hmm. about girls. Mm -hmm. 
And with young girls under the age of 18 in San Francisco, we were arresting girls at 50 times the rate wow. of other counties within California in San Francisco. So when you started looking at those numbers, you realize that we have a huge problem here in San Francisco where we like to consider ourselves a progressive bastion. Mm -hmm. And what we tried to do, <clears throat> at least in the last five years, is answer the question, why the disparities? And you do find certain categories of crime where you might have one type of person or one ethnicity overrepresented. But that was the exception, not the rule. What we found more commonly, and we just did a study uh, last July with the University of Pennsylvania that showed this, that if you're a person of color, you're more likely to be in jail, even though you're more likely to uh, fulfill the requirements for release. Your bail is gonna be higher, your sentence is gonna be higher, and you're also gonna be charged with more serious crimes and more crimes than your counterpart. So when you add all that up, it results at every critical juncture in the criminal justice system, there is disparity, there is injustice, and inequality. And these are also national trends that manifest here in San Francisco, but you have really drawn attention to a very specific policy here, which is the gang injunctions recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, City Attorney Dennis Herrera has said that he wants to remove as many people as he can from the gang injunctions. On the other side, those opposed to it are saying, let's just get rid of them completely. I think you fall more along those lines, right, Jeff Adachi? Can you talk a little bit about why that policy reinforces racism in your view? Well, the idea of gang injunctions was borrowed from L.A. And in L.A., what happened is that the police would just say, okay, you, 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 and you are in a gang injunction. There was no justification for that. There was no court process that went along with that. And people were placed on these gang injunctions for life. And it was just in the last year that Los Angeles said, you know what, we made a mistake. We have all these people on a gang injunction that had been prohibited from uh, congregating in certain neighborhoods. But more importantly, they would be subject to arrest for violating the gang injunction. Mm -hmm. And face up to six months in jail as well. Right. Standing. And this is for things as simple as being out past curfew, mm -hmm. uh, for associating with other alleged gang members as well, or just being within certain zones in neighborhoods if they were right. seen. In, in San Francisco, uh, the city attorney, Dennis Herrera, borrowed from that but he took every case to court and every individual to court. And the problem with that is that you don't have a right to a lawyer. And it's a civil proceeding, not a criminal proceeding. So most people were not in a position to contest the, the gang injunction. We represented a handful of people, uh, and I represented myself, and a young man, whose only infraction was to rap about a gang. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was put on the gang injunction mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. And we succeeded in getting him off the injunction. But there were a lot of people who didn't have that opportunity. And so now we're looking at really uh, the need to, to end these injunctions, one, because they become a tool of oppression, which has continued. You know, we're gonna talk more about the criminal justice system overall, but it's also created a situation where most of these folks don't have any criminal history, they haven't committed any crimes, and they're still prohibited from living in the communities where their grandparents or parents live, where they have children. And so it's really contributing to the breakdown. We're talking about gentrification, people yes. moving out of the city. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why. Yes, mm -hmm. to be able to have some housing and better employment opportunities. Uh, Nikki Jones, mm -hmm. you have said that if we could get rid of these j gang injunctions, that even though they are chipping away at them, to get rid of them completely mm -hmm. would be a very important gesture for the city. What do you think, what message do you think it would send? Well, symbolically, uh, one of the things I write about in, in the book is the way the city responded to the crack epidemic. And, and San Francisco Chronicle did a special report, front page, uh, and, they, and uh, people in the system talk about this new ruthless, ruthless breed of young people uh, akin to a social atomic bomb about to go off. Mm. Uh, and San Francisco, even as tolerant and progressive as it is, responded just like every other city to the, the crack epidemic. You started a war on black youth. Uh, and now the gang injunction, right, today, 2018, uh, when it was introduced almost 10 years ago, those young people, and most of them, the vast majority in the Western edition, were uh, under the age of 30, about half, 24 to, to 18. 
right? Those young people are now 10 years older. And so what we know is that the biggest predictor about of whether or not you're going to be in violent activity is, is age. So the idea that Dennis Herrera is hanging on to this injunction when it defies um, the evidence, the best evidence we have out there, or the best research, I should say, that we have out there, is just odd to me. Right? So then you have to ask the question, well, what is this doing? Right? What, what is it serving? Uh, and to me, I think it's, it's symbolic that uh, the city still has a hold on brown and black youth. Uh, and so the point that I make is that we, at, as at, at the city at some point has to say the war is ending against black youth and well, brown youth. Yeah, well, and if I are. can, I, I would say that we can't um, deny the fact that those gang injunctions don't just come out of nowhere. They mm -hmm. end up in communities that are undergoing massive development processes. Absolutely. So when the gang injunctions were introduced in the mission <coughs> and certainly in the Bayview, where I believe it was their inaugural kind of arrival, um, it was at a time when San Francisco was making a lot of decisions about what development would look like mm -hmm. in the southeast section of the city. Mm -hmm. And as we were talking earlier backstage, there's a lot of work that goes into preparing neighborhoods for change. And change is not the part that's bad. The question is, um, do the people that live in that community get to benefit from the changes that are coming? Do they get to drive and determine what changes end up being implemented? And are those changes in the service of a better quality of life for the people who live in that community first and foremost? And then next, for the people that um, will also be attracted to that neighborhood. And I will say that uh, the gang injunctions were kind of targeted in Bayview in, in public housing um, and were absolutely a key part of making sure that the neighborhood could be safe for development, meaning that people could see Bayview Hunters Point, which up until very recently wasn't even on any tourist mm -hmm. maps in San mm -hmm. Francisco. Yep. You see you know, mm -hmm. all kinds of neighborhoods that you want to go visit and eat at, but Bayview is just kind of the shaded area in the southeast, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, newsflash, people have been living and thriving there for a very long time. Um, but it, it's not until we start to think about how to generate resources for the city that we also start to think about how to use tools like gang injunctions mm -hmm. to be able to clear the path for uh, corporate development to right. succeed. Yeah, and just to, to second that, yes, I lived in, in, in the uh, gang in, in the Western, in the Fillmore. The people there call it the Fillmore. Yeah, <laughs> when folks are talking about crime and violence, they call it the Western edition, yeah, right? Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> Tell the truth. <laughs> uh, so I lived there when the gang injunction came down. I, I moved there right around the time when the preliminary injunction came out and, and lived there for, for two and a half years. And the point Alicia, Alicia is making about um, development and gentrification is right on. Uh, the neighborhood is, uh, has, has gentrified rapidly since that time. You have a, a hip boutique, you have a, a Belgian beer bar, you know, <laughs> yeah. Of course you have a Starbucks, you had Starbucks first, mm -hmm. as, you, as how you knew it was gonna gentrify, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so the idea that these two things are intertwined was so obvious on the ground at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and people in the neighborhood understand, under, understood that too. Yes, you're really both underscoring the point that gentrification and crime policies as you see it, are linked mm -hmm. and very much crackdowns on crime, a company trying to make places safer for newcomers, as you said, not necessarily mm -hmm. the, um, the residents who are there. One issue with that uh, is that as people move out, Latino, African American, I mean, there have been recent statistics, I think, in a Mercury News article that talked about what percentage of folks of color who do live in the Bay Area can actually afford a home here. It continues to drop significantly for black and Latino families. Um, Asian Americans are doing a little better, uh, much better actually, to be honest. But um, what happens is that dispersal also creates a dispersal of power. So, so when you're trying to organize around a specific issue that meets your needs, right, the people aren't there anymore. As someone who has put together a movement, Black Lives Matter, across an entire nation, what what have you learned from that process about trying to bring together basically people who have, have dispersed, mm. Alicia Garza? Well, what I've learned is that um, people have a lot of love for their city. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I'm somebody who is the product of someone who's a fourth generation San Franciscan. And so, you know, I can't afford to live in San Francisco anymore and haven't been able to for many years. Uh, but I will say that um, that dispersal is absolutely forced. And I think oftentimes we talk about it as um, a choice, right? People choose to leave, they choose to seek greener pastures, they choose to do these things. And I think that that's a misnomer. I think what's real is that when you are living in a community that is devoid of the things that you need to live well, um, it's not really a choice mm -hmm. that you're making. You're, you're actually forced to figure out ways to defend your dignity and to figure out a way to take care of your family and the people you love. Mm -hmm. And if there's a place that you can go that allows for those opportunities, that's what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. But that's not a, I woke up today and decided I wanted to move to Antioch. Mm -hmm. This is a, um, I can no longer afford to make ends meet mm -hmm. and there are consequences if I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so I need to actually go somewhere that is more within my means. I think what I've also learned and, and this is uh, certainly timely because we are right <coughs> smack dab in the middle of election season, um, is that these issues are still very contested. And um, I know for, for San Franciscans, people are making decisions about who you're going to elect for mayor. Mm -hmm. And I know this is a nonpartisan forum, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to weigh in on that question. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that I, I think what we've seen in terms of the dispersal of power um, is playing out, mm -hmm. right, in the mayor's race. It's mm -hmm. playing out on the board of supervisors. And the bigger question, I mean, it is a, it's important, the choice that people are making tomorrow. But the bigger question is, um, who's paying attention to what is left of black San mm -hmm. Francisco? And how are we doing the work to make sure that black communities get to have a say in the city that we've built? This process, this isn't the first time this yeah. process has happened. The Fillmore has gone through this process twice now. Uh, Bayview is undergoing this process. And quite frankly, uh, what is a city like San Francisco without the people who make it the bastion that it is? Mm -hmm. That is the question that we need to be asking ourselves today, tomorrow, and every day from there. In addition to that question though, are there strategies to implement to try to make that more of a forefront issue for people to see their connection to all of this? Yeah, so. Uh, I mean, this is walls and bridges, so to some degree, how do we build connections across maybe people with very different interests, right? Coalitions are very important. And when we were running campaigns in the Bayview, we had to bring together um, people that would probably never sit at a table together in any other time or place, but we ultimately shared the same goal of wanting to see development that was driven by community and not corporate interests. And so um, we've had to kind of reach, not even across the aisle, but like literally reach into different experiences um, and say, hey, Ultimately, what we're trying to build here and what we're trying to maintain um, is the sense that people can come to San Francisco, live in San Francisco, be able to live well here, and be able to have a voice in the decisions that impact our lives. That is what makes up the heart of San Francisco, and that's the thing that can unite us um, across differences. But I think another strategy that we have to pay a lot of attention to uh, is that uh, I would say that black communities by and large are left out of most, uh, most campaigns and movements here in San Francisco. Mm. Um, we have a, and I have been a part of many uh, multiracial organizing efforts, which I think are important, bringing people together from low-income parts of, of every community to fight for what we need to live with dignity. And I will say that black people are incredibly under-organized and under-resourced. Hmm. And that has a huge impact on our ability to build coalitions that are vibrant and that actually take into account the numbers of different experiences that actually add texture and layer to the kinds of policy that we need to be moving in the city and county of San Francisco. Speaking of policies and, Jeff Adachi, how much of a setback do you think it is for communities to feel safe and welcome in San Francisco after District Attorney George Gascon failed to charge any of the officers involved in the uh, Mario Woods shooting or um, Louis Congress shooting as well. But, uh, this is something you also had some words <laughs> yeah. for. Well, 
I don't know how many of you have seen um, the you know video of the Mario Woods shooting, um, but you should watch it. And there's one that they have on YouTube, which is in slow motion. And you can see that the officers have this young man uh, surrounded. He's obviously going through a mental health crisis. That's clear from what he's saying. And uh, his, his back is up against a, a wall. Um, and the officers are surrounding him. And they have seven, eight, uh, nine officers surrounding him, all with their guns out. And uh, he begins walking away. Nobody's in danger. None of the officers have been threatened. It's true that he did have a knife, but he wasn't uh, approaching or attempting to assault anyone with it. And uh, 21 shots. You know, it, it's, it's what comes close to, it is a public execution, is what you see on there. And you watch that, and you think, wait, 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 is this something out of the wild, wild west? You know, yet this is police officers. And when police officers are not held accountable for, I mean, if you or I were on video doing that, we'd be arrested in a matter of, of seconds, if not hours. You know, the, the district attorney uh, didn't make a decision in this case for two and a half years. Two and a half years. I mean, if you can imagine that, and he was given $2 million from the city to create this new task force with, you know, nine lawyers and investigators and support staff and everyone else who was, you know, supposed to uh, objectively e examine these cases. And he came out with a, a written report, and essentially he said, well, you know, this was a clear-cut case of, of self-defense. He said, I don't like it, but the officers uh, felt that lives were threatened. Uh, we have to accept that as being subjectively and objectively reasonable since they are police officers and we have to change the law if we want to change, uh, you know, change the, the outcome in these cases. And of course, I mean, this is a pattern of what we've seen uh, across the country, law enforcement not uh, being held accountable. And you know, in, in a case where perhaps murder charges were not appropriate, what about involuntary manslaughter? What about negligently discharging a firearm? Um, what about a misdemeanor charge? Mm -hmm. But there was absolutely you know, no accountability. And then there was the, the shooting of Luis Gagora Pat. And even though that was not captured on video, the actual shooting itself, I mean, you see the officers arrive. They find out there's a man in a mental health crisis. He has a knife in his hand. Again, he's not attacking anyone. And you hear shots uh, on the video within seconds, I think 20 seconds or something like that. And then you have Jessica Williams, who was fleeing in a car and was shot to death. And we're still having this debate as to whether officers should be able to shoot into a moving car or not, when every best practice, including Department of Justice, has said, let's not do that. So here in San Francisco, you know, where we have a supposedly progressive policing and progressive law enforcement, uh, we're, we're seeing, again, a repeat of what we've seen in San Francisco in this country uh, since the beginning of time. San Francisco, we've never had an officer uh, ever charged in an officer-involved shooting. It's never happened in San Francisco. And this coupled with the racist text messages that uh, came out and, you know, <coughs> this was a police sergeant's cell phone. And this is a case that we broke uh, after revelations came out that there was a group of officers who were breaking in, into people's uh, uh, homes without warrants and they were stealing. And so we held a press conference in our office because we had a videotape that showed them doing this at the Henry Hotel on, uh, on 6th Street. And as a result, uh, the sergeant's uh, cell phone was seized and the most horrendous uh, text messages were you know, they're uh, referring to uh, black people as monkeys and, and talking about burning crosses on the lawns and, and all of this. Uh, and this was banter going back and forth uh, between police officers. So when you're looking at, you know, San Francisco police, uh, the police force here, and you look at within the context of what we've seen just in the last couple of years, I mean, it just doesn't... Uh, uh, jive with with what we expect. I mean, we're paying these officers. San Francisco police officers are paid some of the best wages in the country, even much more than New York. 
Is this what we get? Do you think we're getting better? The police department is getting better? You know, I, I meet every month with uh, Chief Scott, uh, who I understand is going to stay in our city and, and be the chief. There are some. Yes, there are some rumors that he was going he was to gonna leave. Angeles. But, um, you know, I, I, I believe that he's trying to implement uh, these uh, 200 odd uh, recommendations made by the Department of Justice. As you know, after the Mario Wood shooting, the Department of Justice came in and uh, supposedly had a collaborative approach and came up with these recommendations. But, you know, we still have a long way to go. And it, it involves changing the culture. Is it getting better? I, I believe it is. And, and I, I talk to police officers all the time. People always think that I'm at odds, you know, with police, and some of them I am. But uh, I do talk to them because... Yes. I think the goal of all this is that we want a police force, you know, that respects diversity and that is not racist and is not acting in a way inconsistent with our values as San Francisco, Siskins. Well, Nikki Jones, what I find so telling about the district attorney's decision not to prosecute was the statement that he made that he felt that under the law, the mm -hmm. way it's written, he mm -hmm. couldn't charge them, mm -hmm. but that maybe the law needs to change. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I'm so struck by that is because it really kind of is the essence of what we're talking about here, mm -hmm. right? What are the laws and policies mm -hmm. that contribute or reinforce um, racism here in the mm -hmm. Bay Area? What is your reaction to, to that specifically? Mm -hmm. But also, I think one of the things that I'm struck by when um, I've heard both you and um, Jeff Adachi talk about really observing closely the interactions mm -hmm. of police mm -hmm. here in San Francisco is that you're also seeing reasons for hope and maybe programs that are being, so that even though we've talked about how- Did I say that? Did I say I was well, hopeful? Well, <laughs> yes, you did. You said, you said, what I said. Along, so you can't do this work and not to some degree have that's hope. That's right, that's true. But I guess the that's point true. the point that I'm trying to make is the same things that can sometimes make us complacent, the sense of that's progressivism, right. the right. sense that's of we're right. all, um, right. you know, that, that San Francisco is a more racially diverse yeah. and equitable place, does create some programs, some, um, strategies mm -hmm. that are effective. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so the first Sorry, part that of that, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine, that's fine. So the first part of that is that Gascon is right in that regard. And that is why we don't see uh, the, the charging of officers in these cases. Uh, all of the protection is for officers. And so as long as officers can articulate that there is a threat to officer safety, that organizes so much of the encounter. And of course, racial uh, bias and racism gets into that. And so one of the things that you've seen other departments do, and what's uh, sh uh, striking is the reform that law enforcement agencies have undergone since Black Lives Matter. Right, the shifts that have happened that, that took decades when it comes to mass incarceration. Uh, so, there is, so I am you know, uh, uh, impressed by that. Right? So there is a possibility if you're operating within uh, the paradigm of, of law enforcement. And so what you see is departments make their policies and practices more stringent than what will be allowed by the Constitution. So that even if someone can't be charged, they can at least be dismissed from that. Now, of course, they may be hired somewhere else, um, but you know, there are, it, it is in fact true that the, the law has to change or all departments have to be oriented around something other than officer safety, the safety, maybe the safety of everyone involved. Um, but I also wanna say, and then encounter, but I also wanna say, um, to you know, kind of pick up on something that Jeff said, and just to think about racism in, in policing more generally and in a place like San Francisco, which when you look at the police departments around the country, is, you know, is not uh, seen to be especially militaristic, not seen to be that way when compared to other, some other departments. So may have, may have this reputation as, as more tolerant and progressive, but you could have uh, a, a, a whole force of officers who are tolerant and progressive and still have racial disparities because of the way that policing is organized. Right? So in the history of San Francisco, we've moved from a relationship of policing black neighborhoods of a quarantine, keep black people in their place. When they leave their place, put them back in the neighborhood. Right? And we've moved in part, you know, large part after the, the crack epidemic to uh, being there all the time, 
right? Um, uh, you know, deep penetration of the system, bureaucratic expansion, so lots and lots of paperwork. Right? And so as long as that kind of place-based policing, which is seen as an innovation, yes, seen like as Oakland's progressive. Hotspot, OPD's hotspot. Hotspots, right? I could tell you where the hotspots are, right? It's tied, it's tied to the places that were redlined mm -hmm. in the 1930s. Right, uh, and uh, and so in, in San Francisco, more recently in the in the 1940s, when the black population arrived in mass, if you look at where folks live, that's where they live today. Mm -hmm. That is where they live today. And then you look at the red safety zones in the gang injunction, and those safety zones just happen to be within those places that were red on the map. And so I think until we actually get with that. Right? Even if we have the most progressive, or I actually live in Oakland, so I should say, okay. even if San Francisco has the most progressive department in the country, you can still reproduce racial disparities. Right? And, and, and I think it's really important to, to remember that. Yeah. I just want to pick up on, Jeff, uh, on one, one thing you said. I, I read, uh, I think it was in Willie Brown's column, Sunday, where he said the Black Lives Matter movement is silent. I don't know if you saw that. Is what? It was silent. He said it was silent or something like that. And, and I, I kind of read that and I was like, really? Maybe in Willie Brown's world. But uh, I'm going to ask him about that when I see him tomorrow. Yeah, please but, do. But, <laughs> but I have to say, I mean, you know, I, I've, I've been working in the quote system, the injustice system for 32 years. And the Black Lives Matter movement has had a tremendous impact. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that influence the change that we're seeing now. But the kind of change, changes we're seeing in the law, mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's called implicit bias. I mean, the Roseanne, uh, fire, you know, firing, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and all of that, the Me Too movement. Bail you know, reform. You all know, bail, it. yeah, we're, you know, these are huge mm -hmm. institutions that, you would never even imagine would be assailable even a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And now they're being debated and they're talked about. And I really see this, and you know, we can talk about what's happening with Trump and with the federal government and all, but it's, it's, it's this war of values, right? And, and one of the values is diversity. Yeah. And that's something that we can all value, we can all participate in, our children can be part of that future, you know, versus, you know, white supremacy or versus racism mm -hmm. or implicit bias or whatever you, you call it. And, you know, is it something that is going to benefit us uh, as human beings, you know, in the future? I, I think so. I, I think this is part of our evolution because this all was out there in the world just like pollution was five years ago or six years ago. And I'm not you know, mm -hmm. suggesting that it's a great thing that Trump was elected, you know, for the evolution of humankind, but I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that, you know, <laughs> with the strides that have been made, and I said this even when Trump was elected, that Black Lives Matter and the, the, the fight against mass incarceration is going to continue. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not possible for it to mm -hmm. be stopped. Well, I'd love to get Alicia Garza's reaction <laughs> to the notion that Black Lives Matter is silent. I wouldn't <laughs> describe them as <laughs> silent, but I would say that it does feel like they have taken a little bit of a step back from where the group was earlier in terms of really visible at protests. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if there's been a conversation about the best strategy for Black Lives Matter or the best use of protest in Black Lives Matter? Mm, there's a lot in that question, so let me break it down a little bit. Um, first and foremost, I, I think what's important for us to understand about movements is that they have to belong to all of us. And, you know, I do, I hear this sentiment a lot about like, where is Black Lives Matter? Like, why are you not, you know, taking the streets and wiling out? And it's like, look, at the end of the day, protest is a tactic mm -hmm. that has to be a part of a broader strategy. But even bigger than that, we can't leave it up to black people to fight this mm -hmm. fight. Mm -hmm. And I just need to like say that. Mm -hmm. So um, right now, <laughs> we are not the ones making these laws and these policies. Mm -hmm. We are not the ones tasked with enforcing these policies. And I think we have done our work to raise the level of awareness around where not only are there cracks in the system, but 
also, to be quite frank, where the system was set up to do exactly what it's designed to do. And so uh, when, when people like George Gascon say, well, we've got to change the laws, that's an appeal to us, mm -hmm. not to Black Lives Matter. That's an appeal to all of us as voters, as mm -hmm. constituents, as people who want to come to these mm -hmm. conversations and, and talk about how do we understand why the things are happening that are happening are happening and what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing that we need to do and that is right within our hands um, is to be asking these questions of the people who are representing us. Mm -hmm. um, because to be quite frank, mm -hmm. uh, we do actually have a lot of control over how policing happens in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have to wait for the Ferguson Commission or the federal government to come in and do reports and these things. I mean, you know this, you've been doing this 32 years, that really what this takes is an engaged democracy and we need to be that at the local level. Mm -hmm. I'll also say this, um, for, and I can't speak for a whole movement, right? I think people <laughs> think sometimes <laughs> I have like some red button and I just get to be like, turn up, you know? Um, <laughs> I don't no, get it's to, definitely I don't get to pick up the bat phone, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> what, what Patrice and Opal and myself created was a network of organizations and chapters that are organizing locally in their communities. Yeah. And so right now, um, we are much more than a hashtag or a series of social media platforms. We have 40 chapters in four countries, right? So I, th I think we're doing our piece. <laughs> and part of where we're moving toward now is really trying to figure out this question of how do we build black political power? Because while we're waiting on folks to get, you know, as upset as we are, mm -hmm. about what's happening to black people, um, this question of are black people able to impact the decisions that impact and affect our lives is really front and center. So um, what you'll see, and I think what you have been seeing, um, is that there are people who are in the streets raising awareness, raising consciousness about what's happening, making sure we're not sweeping cases like Mario Woods under the rug. And I will say um, that if it wasn't for Black Lives Matter activists and longtime organizers and activists from the mission and other places, nobody would know who Mario Woods is. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I will say that um, a lot of our work right now is figuring out how do we build political power and how do we do that in a political context, right, where um, it is pretty unclear who stands for what. Mm. Uh, so we have incredible opportunities in front of us um, to you clarify. Mean who within the black community or no, just generally like I, across I mean, the country? I mean, mm. we, have a, we have a new president, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think what we should also see this moment as is a real struggle for the future of political parties and like what we stand for. I there see. is a lot of unclarity about what is mm -hmm. the uh, distinguishing nature, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, um, between parties. And that makes people uncomfortable sometimes when I say that. And it's not to say, okay, let's, you know, that's why we have to just move a third party strategy. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that the, um, the ways in which we are organized politically um, are changing. And the clarity around what we stand for on whatever side of the aisle you're on um, is really murky. And that makes for a challenging political environment and it actually sows the seeds for getting into situations like the one that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to quickly remind our audience that in about three minutes, we'll be taking audience questions. So if you have questions, you, you can begin lining up uh, at the microphone to the left of the, to your left near the door, not, not my can, left. Can I just say one thing? I mean, what sure. you just said is so profound. I mean, that, and, and that'd be a good response to Willie Brown. <laughs> ask me. But, Raising consciousness, at me. <laughs> right? Raising consciousness, and not saying that okay, it's going to be us that's going to change this. It's us that's going to bring on bail reform. It's us that's going to change policing. Uh, makes it a, a, a collective responsibility. And so when you see the NFL is going to start penalizing players, you know who who uh, take Don't. a knee. Mm -hmm. You know what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. You're a fan. You watch. You know. You watch uh, sports on TV, you pay money for the tickets, you know, what do you think about that? What's gonna be your reaction to that? You know, and, and what responsibility? 
That's well, great. here's one question that before we go to audience questions that I'd like all of you to weigh in on, which is tomorrow is June 5th, so it will be, quote, election day. And I'm curious for those who haven't voted yet, if there is a measure on the ballot that you would like to call out to either support or oppose in terms of the fight against affirming racism in this country, in terms of a policy that you think either attempts to try to affirm racism so we should oppose it or something that you think would really be important to support and uh i'll start with nikki judge you're looking at me like you're yeah. thinking hard so it's not coming right to your head so does anybody have one in mind that you well wanna... we just happen to have four public defenders running for judges and you know despite mm -hmm. whether you think people should run for judges i mean there's that debate going on judges are electable every six years and you know what we're seeing across the country and we're seeing that in this election too are people running for district attorney, progressives running for judge because they want to see change. And again, that's not something that was dictated by Black Lives Matter or <laughs> any other group. This is something that people are doing. And we're seeing LGBTQ people running for office mm -hmm. in, in numbers like we've never seen before. And you know, it's very powerful that we're seeing this now yes. in the electorate. So mm -hmm. it, it, it allows us, I think, to make different decisions uh, and, 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 and truly vote our conscience when we have choices. And that's what we're seeing now, is we're having uh, you know, politicians who favor criminal justice reform against those who don't. And that's a choice. Mm -hmm. Alicia Garza. Ditto. <laughs> I think it's also really important more and more yeah. people to be educated on who the judges are. That's always been something yeah. that people have let kind of go on their ballots. I'm thinking in Alameda County, the universal pre-K, right? I think, and, and um, so that's important. There's also one about libraries that I, I happen to think is, is really important. Very important. Um, and, you know, so those are like small, small chips away, right, yes. at the kind of the infrastructure uh, of racism. But when you ask that question, it makes me think that the propositions aren't framed that way. Mm -hmm. Because when they're framed that way, they come off as divisive, hmm. right? And they're not the, the kind of best hook to get people who aren't deeply uh, concerned with that to vote in favor. And that, that kind of gets back to the first comment I made, is that we have to be more comfortable understanding that our policies need to be <laughs> proactive because they are addressing and they're kind of redress for what has happened. Right? And so I, I don't, we're not quite there yet, so we keep, you know, we keep chipping away in these, in these ways. There's also a big transit, transit uh, right. uh, yeah. initiative that's on the ballot. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we should understand transit as racialized, absolutely. Um, as we're talking about gentrification and who's having to move out of the city centers, um, we're also talking about raising taxes on folk, right, to pay for uh, public transit to expand, uh, to kind of, uh, I think we're also talking about trying to uh, discourage people from getting in their cars mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, trying to relieve traffic in that way by like upping the tolls. Mm -hmm. But we should be mindful, right, that um, people who used to live here are having to commute three and four hours one way just to be able to work mm -hmm. for a wage that is not paying for that commute. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I would say in, answer, in a relationship to your question, all of these measures are important. <laughs> and you're right that they're not being framed in such a way where we automatically get uh, the racialized impact, but it, it, it only takes another layer of thinking to really ask ourselves, who might this impact, right? If it's not my biggest issue, mm -hmm. who might this mm -hmm. impact and, and what might this mean for their lives? And that's the way that I, mm -hmm. I really wanna be a part of a community. It's not just thinking about what's good for me, mm -hmm. but also thinking about what's, what's good for my community and my neighbors. Yes, well thank you for those ways to approach the ballot. Um, we will now turn to audience questions and as Marisa said, please keep them short and ending with question marks. <laughs> Hilarious. Yes. <laughs> Hi there. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Amanda. Um, I'm curious, and I think actually each of you, based on your experiences and perspectives and research, um, will have an answer to this question. But how are what are how are other cities addressing racism and these types of issues? Are they doing a better job of that? And if so, what are they doing? Maybe in each of your work, what are cities you look to that are maybe setting some examples for us? 
And anyone can start. I mean, I, 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 can, <laughs> I, I, I can say, you know, from a public defender's perspective, I've had the opportunity in the last couple of years to travel, I don't know, maybe about 20 states in the South, uh, Midwest, and talk to public defenders about what's happening in their uh, respective justice systems. And it, it is sort of the same everywhere, uh, particularly in urban cities, but also in rural cities at all, you know, where the, you're first trying to find the problem, right? And <clears throat> in Alaska, you will know, have the Aleuts who are being discriminated against, but it's the same issue and the same disparities. And then the question is why? Mm -hmm. And then the third question, which rarely is gotten to, is like, okay, so what do we do about it? Mm -hmm. And to really try to come up with effective s solutions. And there are effective solutions. I mean, regardless of what you think of Proposition 47, which is passed by the majority of state voters, it made possession crimes, uh, drug possessions, misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it operated uh, to remove a whole number of people, mostly of color, from being in state prison for possessing drugs. And so, you know, those kinds of policy shifts have huge impacts. And you're seeing this around the country. You know, we're actually fighting for bail reform now, but Kentucky, uh, New Jersey, uh, Maryland, uh, and, you know, two dozen other states have already enacted some form of bail reform. And, you know, as, as, as it is now, only the United States and Philippines are the only countries that allow a for-profit bail system where you can post, you know, if, if you have money, it doesn't matter if you're charged with murder, you can get out of your, Bernie Madoff was out on bail, right? Because he could afford his own security detail, but there are people right now who are in jail because they don't have $1,000, they don't have, you know, and, and you go to other places, I, I, I was in Mississippi talking to the lawyers there, they have over a thousand unindicted people these are people who haven't been charged, who are arrested. It takes 120 days before they'll charge you there, and they keep you in, in jail that time. So, you know, it's like you, you go there, and it's like, what country am I in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, just to add to that, so we talked about gang injunctions. There are other uh, cities that are striking down gang injunctions or letting go of gang injunctions, and so that's something that could be done uh, and should be done uh, here. Homelessness, right? That's a big... T and how is the city going to approach homelessness? I would encourage people to be cautious about any platform that suggests that the, the solution to homelessness is uh, some, somewhere in, in the criminal justice system, it is about more police, to police homelessness. That's, that's not how you solve homelessness. You solve homelessness with housing, right? With secure housing. And other cities have done that, and they have, have not required uh, things like people to be sober before they get into housing. And what they found is that once people get into housing, they get sober, right? Um, and then the, the last one that I've been kind of um, following from the, the distance of the East Bay is car robbery break-ins. That has become you know, this big issue in the city, and it's very hard for me after doing the work I did and understanding uh, that young people lost their lives, and that was really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and the city did, wasn't in an uproar about that in the way it seems to be uh, for car break-ins, yep. right? Uh, which is a, a crime of, of opportunity. But just looking from a distance, I see you know this um, people talking about organized gangs. That's racialized language. That's politicizing crime. That's what got us in, in recent history to where we are now. Yeah. So I would encourage folks to be wary of that when you see that kind of framing. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Next question. Hi, sorry, it's kind of related. I was wondering if any of you have examples of communities or policies that have kind of inclusively addressed the changes that are leading to gentrification specifically? Kind of examples where it's not been a disaster? <laughs> I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't hear the question entirely. <laughs> well, I can give you some options for what we can be doing here um, because I think uh, similarly to criminalization, right? Gentrification works uh, almost in a carbon copy way anywhere you find it. Um, and so uh, let's just talk about what I think San Francisco can be doing. Um, because to me, uh, San Francisco also can, if it wants to, uh, set precedent for what happens across the country. And California can do that as well. Um, so first and foremost, I think 
we really have to pay attention to um, how development is funded. So a lot of the reasons that we get in these weird uh, kind of conundrums is because, um, it's a longer story, but it's because there is less money coming from the federal government to states. And so states have to figure out how to generate revenue in different ways. And development ends up being a core piece of that. Uh, so what we found in the Bayview, for example, was that and a lot of the development that was being pushed was being used to pay for infrastructure improvements that the city needed anyway, mm -hmm. right? But had no other way of funding. And so mm -hmm. all of these things are really tied in and we need to have a conversation about that as a city. What are the ways in which we are gonna generate revenue for the things that we want and need, whether that be improving lives or building new housing, et cetera. Um, the affordable housing movement in San Francisco has actually set precedent across the country by doing things like inclusionary zoning, which is requiring development to have a certain percentage of affordability uh, as it relates to housing mm -hmm. units. Mm -hmm. um, affordability in San Francisco is a really complicated thing because it, we get lumped in yeah. with Sonoma County and like all these other places, right? So the area median income um, is really high. <laughs> and so when you start talking about affordability, you're actually talking about affordable, at least five years ago, it was affordable for people who were making $160,000 a year or more. Um, and we've got to dig in on that a little bit. Uh, when we were moving a ballot initiative in Bayview, we were trying to make 40% of all the housing that was built uh, or sorry, 50% of all the housing that was built to be affordable to people making 100% uh, 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 of the neighborhood median income, meaning the median income in Bayview Hunters Point at that time was $40,000 a year. Okay, so what does it mean mm -hmm. to make housing affordable mm -hmm. to people who need it in the communities in which it's being developed? So really looking at that income spread, right? Um, which is state policy, so we gotta kinda look outside of San Francisco to do that, but also we can set norms and precedents here in the city and county. Um, and then the final thing I think would be very much around evictions and rent control. Um, we have, and this isn't just about like communities of color that depend on rent control to live in places like San Francisco, but it's also about seniors with fixed disabilities or fixed incomes, right? It's about people who are on disability. It's about really making sure that folk aren't in this precarious position all the time to lose the little bit of housing that they got, right? Um, so I know we have lots of conversations here and throughout the Bay Area about how do we make more housing? And I think actually we need to figure out um, not just how to build more, but how to make it more accessible mm -hmm. so that people can actually get into it. Mm -hmm. um, and in a place that's like San Francisco where we're seven by seven and you can't actually sprawl, right? We can get much smarter mm -hmm. about how we produce housing units so that um, uh, there's a wide range of people that get to access it. And right now the way that it is is that only a small sliver of mm -hmm. people who can afford to live here can afford to access the new um, units that are being built. Those are like three concrete things I think we can do. And I think if it's okay, we can go to the next question. That was a very comprehensive mm -hmm. <laughs> answer. In terms of Thank standards. you. Um, my question is very simple. Uh, it's what is a person of color? And I'm looking for a definition here because when I grew up, there was a, the, the term colored person as in NAACP, also Negro was a, another term, and they were people who were the descendants of African-American slaves in this country. Now the term seems to have been twisted around and we have person of color and often it applies to people claim person of color and they, they have no, um, you know, they don't belong to the group that I think of as, as colored persons. So I'm wondering who coined this phrase and um, it seems now that um, it applies to persons of some colors, but not to persons of other colors. So, um, do you have an issue with the term "person of color"? Well, Is I don't understand it because some people who I would not consider a person of color mm -hmm. claim to be well, Nikki, a person of color. So, I think we, yeah. Would no. you like to try that? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you gonna do this? <clears throat> you want me? So I think one of the, what's important to understand, and it helps to um, you know answer that question, is to understand anti-blackness, and understand that there's a racial hierarchy uh, white su that white supremacy relies on, and that whiteness is on the top, blackness is on the bottom, and everyone is measured, uh, evaluated on their proximity to or distance from blackness. And so the idea of person of color indicates that someone's not white, right? Yeah, but which white is not even a color. Well, whiteness is a concept, right? Yeah, and right. and to, to which white people attach themselves, and other people can attach themselves as well, right? But but I think what what may be missing is that understanding of of anti-blackness and how that's also tied to colorism, uh, and so. Um, that, that's my, my attempt. <laughs> Start reading up on anti-blackness and you might find an answer to that question. That was excellent. Yeah, I, I actually think it's a, it's a really interesting question. You know, there was a decision out of the California Supreme Court, People versus Hall in the 1860s, where the whole debate was whether or not Asians, because there was a law then that said that if you were a person of color, you could not testify against a white person in a criminal case. And, and so, this, the whole debate, this is the Supreme Court, is whether or not Asians were kind of like, more like Mongolians, and maybe Mongolians were really black, but then you have this whole question of whether you're like one-fifth or one-eighth, right? People who do Ancestry.com get it back, and they're like, wait a minute, you know, I'm one-sixteenth, you know, African, you know, actually, if you look at the, you know, the genealogy, you'll find that virtually every culture derives from African DNA, right? The, the, the Chinese, yeah. they spent, they spent uh, I don't know how many years researching the issue, trying to establish that Chinese came from Chinese DNA, and they ended up proving just the opposite, that it actually came from, from East Africa. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's, we could have a whole discussion about that. Alicia Garza? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, this is all <clears throat> super, super helpful, and actually, um, I just wanna underscore something that you both are saying and offer a resource. Uh, so Ian Haney Lopez has written about this extensively, about the ways in which whiteness gets codified into law and ascribes power, right, that is um, unearned. So when I think about your question, my mind automatically goes to, yeah, why do we have to have terms people of color or um, have an understanding of a color hierarchy? So I think I understand where you're going there. Um, but the reason that we have to have that, right, is because white supremacy codified it to be so. And so in order to ascribe power, right, to one group of people, um, you had to figure out ways to make laws that would remove power from another grouping of people. And that is codified uh, in law from the <laughs> beginning of this country all the way up until the present. So uh, Ian Haney Lopez writes about this in, I think it's called White by Law, White by Law by Ian Haney Lopez. I teach this in my class. I should remember <laughs> what the name of it is. Um, but he also uh, writes about, uh, he wrote a book called Dog Whistle Racism, right, where you can see, right, why we need to have um, an understanding of who is the norm or the control and um, who is outside of that. Um, finally, I'll just offer that, um, to be frank, <sighs> I do think it's important for us to better understand um, where this term comes from. And the term person of color is a term that kind of drives me nuts, um, <laughs> but it is a solidarity term. Mm -hmm. It is not meant to um, describe where people are from or the culture that they are coming from. It is meant to um, relate the struggles of people who are dispossessed um, together across racial and ethnic lines. So that comes from social movements that come out of the 1970s. In particular, it comes out of third world feminism, and we could go into a whole long rant about where that mm -hmm. all moved towards. <laughs> um, I'm afraid we've run out of time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for asking those great questions. Thanks. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've got and <laughs> Yeah, that's good.
And that is it for tonight's Walls and Bridges conversation. This is actually the final conversation in our special series. Um, and I just want to thank our panelists for participating. Alicia Garza, Special Projects Director for the National Domestic Workers Alliance and co-founder of Black Lives Matter. Nikki Jones, Professor of African American Studies at UC Berkeley. And Jeff Adachi, San Francisco's Public Defender. So thank you to them. And Thank you to you, our audience. You have raised questions and comments that I think are great fodder for a post-conversation reception, which is what we're going to have. Um, <laughs> you can discuss what you heard tonight, look for some solutions to the issues that were raised, get a chance to talk with some of our panelists and other audience members, and there will be three interactive activities you can participate in facilitated by the Peninsula Conflict Resolution Center. Excellent. Tonight's program was brought to you by Inform and KQED with support from the James Irvine Foundation. Special thanks to everyone here at the Commonwealth Club for hosting us tonight. And I also want to thank all the KQED staff members for putting this on. I particularly want to acknowledge Joan Martinez and Jeremy Siegel, who worked very closely with me for the, the ones that I was involved in. My name is Mina Kim. Thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs>